This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron-only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. So um, welcome everyone, attendees, and um, Bill, Luke, and Dallas. My, and Bill's chair. Um, uh, uh, chair Bill's chair. And um, welcome to our, our webinar. It's, um, we're going to be talking about modern monetary theory and the media and taking charge of the narrative. So um, just as a reminder again, um, for those who've just joined us, um, any questions that you'd like to ask at the end of the um, discussion, please put them in the Q&A box and you can ask them live. If you raise your hand, we'll um, switch on your mic. And um, so basically we're going to have a couple of questions from um, Dallas and myself. Luke will also, you know, there'll be a conversation between Bill and Luke and then we'll um, switch over to a Q&A. So, Roughly around 40 minutes of discussion and we'll try and get 15 minutes of dis, um, questions before Bill has to leave at 8. Um, so before we commence, I'd like to say an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm broadcasting today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples here today and the land was never ceded. So welcome. Um, it's a delight to have both Luke and Bill. Luke, you will know as a, com a, com a comedian. He's a TV writer and actor, <laughs> well known for Rosehaven, which is um, the last season is now about to strip, well, st will stream live in August. Um, he's also appeared, acted on Utopia, which is a great series as well. We know him best from Lucanomics and um, and the Lucanomics segment particularly that was called or titled Will Australia Ever Run Out of Money, which has gone viral within the MMT community and probably been posted a lot to people as a sort of starter, MMT starter. <laughs> it's a very good well, uh, A big video. thanks to Bill for helping me, uh, for helping me write it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and... Then more, more recently, um, you were on Q&A and um, it was that appearance that really sort of was the catalyst for me to get in contact with you and um, I suppose provide a forum where you could have a longer chat and get into the nitty-gritty of MMT with Bill particularly. So um, Bill, uh, people know well, but he, um, as... Luke, I think, said in one of his recent podcasts he should be all over the news and he's not. Um, he's an economist, an academic and founding scholar of MMT. He's the director of the Centre of Full Employment and Equity, author, prolific blogger at Billy Blog, and most recently created and ran an extremely successful introductory online MMT course with, uh, which had approximately 3,000 enrollees um, from across the world. So well done, Bill. Thank you. Uh, um, a, mus a musician of note. And musician, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So it's exciting to have you both here. Um, and I guess 
I wanted to kick off um, our chat today about MMT in the media by asking you both um, to reflect on your extensive but very different experiences in the media and um, particularly the news media in Australia and what you may you see um, as the barriers presented by the, the prevailing media culture and um, that is sort of standing in the way of MMT becoming mainstream and also wondered whether when answering this question, if you could sort of comment on the most infuriating um, catch cry that we hear nearly several times a day on ABC and other news stations, um, that being taxpayers' money, and comment on why this expression is uh, so problematic. And I guess to get us into some of the fundamentals of MMT and yeah, so if you could maybe get started, Luke, would you like to? We need to. Oh, can you guys hear me? Hello. Um, can you hear okay. me, guys? Yeah, we can hear you. I just make you, you, but we can't see you. Oh, okay, well, it's fine. I'm. I've just uh, made I'm you putting... co-host, so you can turn your um your camera. That's on. probably a good thing, Luke. Oh, uh, it's not... <laughs> sorry, man. I brush I brush my teeth. I told you um, I wanted to be the comedian tonight. I even now uh, put in my invisible one, so we don't have a gap. Hey, again. Mm. Take them out. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Jane, in answer to your question, um, I um, I mean, I've been to be talking about MMT briefly, but it does feel like it's one of those things where it's, um, I don't know, it, it, it's, it doesn't feel so much like a discussion as it's like people are either willing to hear it or it's just sort of scoffed at, uh, like you can't, you can't do that, you can't just... Um, create money out of thin air and it's uh yeah i don't know i um i mean bill will be know more a lot more about this than me but in in, in my experience so far it's uh, it's a lot of people thinking that mmt just means printing money without consequence and that uh no one who studies mmt has ever heard of inflation um that's kind of what i that's been my impression so far well i mean the the problem the problem is what the me you know who is the media and uh, if you think about who goes into economics reporting or finance reporting it's typically undergraduate people who've got an undergraduate degree in economics so already they're set up to be biased to mainstream economics so dominant but but we don't have an. We really don't have an independent media in Australia, and this has been a, a a problem for years and years. It's a very concentrated media, and it's dominated by a few voices. And when I grew up, the Melbourne Age was a really high class publication, and the economist there was uh, Kenneth Davidson, for those who can remember. And he was a true investigative support uh, reporter in the old school tradition. So he used to go out and embarrass governments all the time and, and expose scandals and, and uh, really set a debate up. Now, you know, you read The Age now or, and City Morning Hill, that's Channel 9. Mm. And um, uh so we don't have that independence and we've lost that investigative reporting capacity in Australia and almost ever, anywhere. And uh, as a consequence, uh, reporting has mostly become, especially about the economy, has mostly become uh, getting press releases from corporations, think tanks or politicians and writing them up as, as, as news. And the idea that you would go and get a second voice is really gone. There's no contest anymore in the media. It's just writing up a press release. And in the old days, and, you know, not in 20 years ago when I was first starting out in academic life, the press had a sort of an unwritten rule that they would always go and get uh, contested voices but they also pursued the knowledge from the academy. 
Now, with the increased sort of financialization of the economy, almost all the economics commentary comes from bankers, economists working for private profit-seeking banks. And so, you know, you see in the morning news on the ABC, our national broadcaster, they go to the Commonwealth Bank analyst for all of the analysis of news and there's a Commonwealth Bank ad in the back of him or her and that's the voice they get and they tend not to come to academic life. Now, I've been asked them why and they say, oh, we can't ever get you. Uh, which is just total nonsense and lies because we've had mobile phones for 25 years yeah, and anybody can get me on a mobile phone. It, it does seem strange because you wouldn't, um, you know, if you were looking at yeah, the state right. of um, children's diets, you wouldn't say we've got an executive from Coca-Cola. So it does seem weird to get someone from Commonwealth Bank to talk about the economy. Yeah, um, so when you think, when, you, when you're asking a question about the direction of interest rates, well, the commercial banks want, to, want interest rates to be higher. So there, of course, they always say, oh, well, interest rates are going to be pushed up. They've got to go up, trying to put suasion onto the Reserve Bank and the debate, oh, interest rates are too low. What? Well, they've got a vested interest in getting interest rates up. And, and the other point, the final point I'd make on this at the moment is that uh, broadcasting companies, particularly the ABC, is under intense pressure from corporations and politicians, particularly ministerial officers, to censor who they give a platform or a voice to. And, you know, I know a lot of people in the ABC and they tell me that they have to ration me when, when, when they want uh, uh, commentary because otherwise they'll get massively attacked by some minister's office or another. And minister's offices have rung my university demanding to suppress my voice. That's what we're up against. Yeah, right. It's, um, yeah, I can't say the ministers come down to the comedy department of the ABC that often, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky. I, I, um, I'm happy to, and I'm happy to address this to Bill's chair. Uh, no, but he's, uh, so, <laughs> I'm sorry. A no, word, it's <laughs> some, some word that I said just activated a TV in my office. Oh, nice. The future. So I had to turn it off. That's okay. Um, I told you this was going to be a comedy show. That's good. It's really good, Bill. I really enjoy it. Um, yeah, it's it's hard. I I mean, I, I'd love to give a shout-out to Michael West, who I think does an excellent job um, in the media. Uh, he's an independent um, who's just funded by his uh, readership. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's tricky. I, I also... A question I had for you, Bill, was just because it's sort of such a fundamental shift in how we think about the economy with, um, you know, not talking about taxpayer money, not talking about debt, which is often used as a um, a weapon in political debates. Like, how do you, um, like, I just want to, like, when I talk to people about MMT sometimes, um, like, for me now, even though I try and, I try and keep an open mind, MMT really does feel like, okay, so this is how the economy actually works and I've just got to slowly convince other people that that's how it works. But I'm assuming people who don't agree with us think just as strongly the opposite way. So how do you bridge that gap when it's such a fundamental shift? Like how do you how do well, you get people across like all, to um, – Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, but it's like all academic disciplines that go through paradigm shift. The, the hierarchy enforces – the hierarchy of the dominant view enforces a particular view from the top, the senior professors, and then all the young wannabes come in after PhDs or whatever, and they really understand the, you know, the system very well that if they start voicing independent of the senior professors, they won't get promoted, they won't get publications, they won't get research grants, and so they play along. And what happens eventually, and I've prob people have probably heard me say this before, but the German physicist had a famous quote which has been sort of bastardised, but it comes out as, paradigm shift one funeral at a time and that's that's the senior academics have got to die off basically mm -hmm. uh, and, and and what 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 happens is as that process of that demographic process is occurring the evidence if, if the paradigm's really uh, off then the evidence base builds up over time and eventually it's like a dam breaking that the evidence just becomes too powerful to resist. And then all the younger scholars jump the fence and 
and try to build their careers in the new paradigm. And we're in that process now. That can take 30 or 40 years. Is there a is there a smoking gun that the economy could do that would help? I mean, I, I, we've talked about this, but I always think about Japan's debt to GDP ratio and how they still have low inflation. Is there a as other countries with you know spending big on COVID and things, you know, see these massive government spending without seeing massive inflation? Will that is that yeah? Will that help or well? Well, it's very hard. You know, I've been banging on about Japan since the 1990s because I got really interested in what was going on in Japan as a young academic, a younger academic. <laughs> and uh, and then you'd be just dismissed by my mainstream colleagues, oh, there's cultural issues there, you know, as if Japan's a weird country and we're not. And uh, I think what we've seen with the GFC and what we've seen subsequently with uh, the pandemic response is that you can't pull the cultural card anymore because all of the WASP countries are, are really following the Japanese pattern. And as a consequence, you know, all of the all of the key elements of mainstream macroeconomics that are used to enforce a particular ideology and a particular class structure and a particular behaviour of government. Uh, 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 have been thrown out. They've been completely blown out of the water now. So that's the evidence dissonance and 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 everybody in mainstream society has to, who does, has any um, interaction with the economic debate has to know that there's something wrong with the mainstream narrative. And so, you, you know, you've got uh, the intergenerational report last week um, predicting deficits now to 2061. Yeah. Times have changed. Yeah, because it, was, it wasn't that long ago that Liberal was selling a, a, a mug saying back in black. Yeah. <laughs> just, I, don't know if I don't know if their merch store has a bunch left in boxes now. So, see, the problem now for us is that at this point, it would be the perfect opportunity for a progressive political force also known as the so-called Labor Party, to really reinforce that in the political debate. But the problem with the Labor Party is that they're morons and they're, they're pursuing this, you know, increasingly you're getting the economic spokespeople from the Labor Party talking about how big the debt is and what have we got for it and all of that stuff, whereas they should be saying, see, people, the government can do anything they want in this space with their, in, without financial constraints. What do we want them to do? That should be the debate, but we're let down now. The, the opportunity is really there, but we're being let down by our political uh, voices. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, Dallas, you need to unmute. Uh Luke, I'm just a bit interested in, to change the subject a little, in how you think COVID might have impacted the arts um, and to what extent you think the government's uh, lack of support was due to its adherence to this idea of the government being fiscally constrained like a household. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, obviously the arts were really hit hard by COVID. Um, I mean, anything that involves people being together in a room was impacted. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of... Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructors that were hit just as hard as I was. Like it's um it's just, you know, anything that involves people together. But it was uh I think something that was disappointing for me was that um the gig economy seemed to have been forgotten by a lot of the um job keeper programs and uh, you know, most of the people we employ are um, you know, filming Rose Haven are are um you know, temporary hires for a few months and then they're gone. And uh, I think for the job keeper yet to be a minimum twelve months, it was um there seemed to be a lot of things that um, just didn't help the arts or um, enabled a lot of people in my industry to slip through the cracks. And I, I assume, I guess it was because they said, uh, well, you know, we've, we were already spending this much money, we can't spend any more. Um, but even when they announced the arts package, it was sort of linked to grants for future shows, not necessarily direct funding. It was, um, it was, just, it was just a disappointing response, I suppose. Um, mm. But, you know, I could say the same about aged care. I could say the same about the environment. There were so many things where I'm just like... You know, they were told in, uh, by their own um, by their own uh, 
independent groups that they paid to do um, consulting for them, you need to spend this much or spend it in this area, and they, and they didn't. So, um, yeah, it was just, uh, just gen general sadness, basically, <laughs> for 2020 mm. and 2021. And, Bill, I mean, I've, in one of your blogs, you were talking about how the stimulus wasn't sufficient uh, from the from the government, and um, and and to what extent is that about? You know, is it just ideology, or do they just think that they can't afford to spend too much? Well, see, I'd go one step further than Luke and say that nothing the federal government does, or any government for that matter, but the federal government in Australia, nothing they do is is independent of an ideological objective. And you just have to see the announcement today. Uh, now that the, his mate Ber Berejiklian is in deep trouble in Sydney, mm. suddenly the rules relating to emergency funding are being relaxed. You didn't see any of you didn't see any of that talk when Victoria was in trouble, but now that uh, because they were wanting to uh, push it down to the, the dictator Dan's, the enemy of the people. Whereas now Gladys is in deep hole and probably going to endanger the whole country with her lack of action and her hubris, suddenly the rules change. Now, the point I'd make about the arts sector, which was a criminal act by the government, but it wasn't just the arts sector, it was the university sector as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're the sectors, if you go back to, you know, John Howard's culture war type thing, they're the sectors which the government, the, the conservative government, despises because they believe that they're, they're the uh, uh, breeding grounds of left-wing thinking. And, you know, you just have to go back to, uh, to Australian Research Council funding decisions where they've deliberate, the minister has deliberately overruled the committee, the independent peer-reviewed suggestions in certain humanities and social science grants because they were dangerous left-wing uh, uh, grants and research projects uh, likely to encourage everyone to become homosexual transvestites. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it's, it's not just that, that they didn't spend money. That was part of it. And it's certainly they wanted to make sure money went to their mates, but they also didn't want to... Uh, they wanted to punish those sectors that they think are dangerous to the conservative message. And, you know, they've, they've really caused serious damage to universities. And because I interact, I'm professionally linked to both the arts sector and the university sector, they've, com they've damaged both sectors very significantly. They, they also did something that I found strange, which was a really, uh, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong here, Bill, but it's sort of supply side focused policies. Like JobMaker, they would... A job maker, I think, was two hundred dollars or, or some sort of um, uh, amount paid to workplaces that hired new people under the age of thirty-five. But it didn't make any sense to me because why would they have an incentive to hire people if they didn't have the demand to need another employee? Like it was just sort of yeah. like it just didn't make any sense. And even the even the Treasury um, analysis of the policy said it's not going to create any jobs, and they still. Did it like I just don't understand how policies like that make any sense? Um, and and the, you know the, the home builder or whatever they called it, yeah, was 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 pitched exactly at upper middle class people that could afford the threshold uh, uh, threshold expense of the home home renovation, and then they just got this bonus on top. And but you know you go back and you see the latest scandals, the car park scandal, and then the sports rorts and the swimming pool in. Christian Porter's electorate in Western Australia. It's oh. just a, it's just a systematic abuse of fiscal uh, capacity. Now, you know, Dallas said, asked me whether the fiscal stimulus was large enough. Well, of course it wasn't, because labour underutilisation rose dramatically and is still at elevated levels. But also, uh, following Luke's point, where they chose to spend the money lacked complete foresight. Uh, they should have been addressed using this uh, uh, fiscal money to address longer-term issues. Hopefully the pandemic's a short-term issue, but uh, uh, reducing carbon in our economy is not a short-term issue, and that could, have, that could have been the target of massive investment now, infrastructure investment. Instead of handing out millions to uh, 
car parks that can't be built and swimming pools that in suburbs that barely exist and what have you. <laughs> Yeah, it's this is the problem. So the stimulus wasn't large enough. It was poorly targeted. It saved the economy because it was a lot of money went into to, uh, um, uh, helping maintain aggregate spending and incomes. But so sure, you could throw money out of the top of a building and it would do that. But it was a really poorly targeted and a really big waste of opportunity. And, and, Bill, a lot of people, have, a lot of the economics commentators are now becoming inflated. You know, they're, they're talking about inflation and how that's a big threat. You, you want to reflect a little bit on that? Oh, not really. I mean, do you really want <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, you know, they've, I, 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 I wrote a Guardian article a couple of weeks ago where I said, you know, they've really, we've, we've made some progress because we've, no one's questioning whether the governments are going to go broke now, except for the Eurozone governments. So we've made some progress. From Think back to the GFC. All the economists and the media commentators were raving on about governments going broke and interest rates going through the roof and yields going crazy. So we've made progress. We're no longer talking about that. And so they've really only got one, one thing left in their bloody kit, kit bag, and that's to play the inflation card. And, and they've been able to start that off because we've had some temporary disruptions in the supply chain and uh, pushing up prices short term. I mean, but you, you're not going to get a structural inflation episode like in the 1970s because the trade unions have, have been decimated. You can't, the wage side, the wage push can't happen anymore. And the if you really analyse the oil prices, which is really driving uh, uh, price pressures at the moment, they're just returning. It's just because people have gone back on the road and are driving. The, the, the OPEC or, uh, you know, uh, standard or benchmark oil price isn't even back to pre-COVID levels. So all you've seen is a rapid drop in oil prices because we didn't drive for six months and now it's going up very quickly. That's not inflation. That's just a cyclical adjustment. There's also, um, and again, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm also seeing a lot of, um, like with the chip shortage and things like that, uh, you know, in my hobby, video game consoles, there's a real shortage. But you're not seeing companies put their prices up. They're just, there's just a bit of a shortfall of supply for now. Um, Some are putting prices up a bit, but they're, but this always happens in a in a return from a deep recession. They just they absorb they absorb uh, the pressures in their margin in the downturn because they don't want to lose market share. And then when demand starts coming back in, they just restore their margins. And so put, you get that sort of short term readjustment. That's not inflation. That's just a cyclical adjustment. And that's really what's going on. Um, <clears throat> look to bring bring it a little bit back to the media, Luke. Um, after your appearances on uh, Q&A and Charlie Pickering, <clears throat> have you had positive responses from other media people or, and or politicians? What, what's been the response? Um, I haven't really talked to a lot of politicians, to be honest, other than uh, Barnaby um, <laughs> at the time. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, I think so. A lot of people on Twitter or um, Facebook or any time I post something like that usually um, are fairly positive. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I I I never feel like I'm saying that that much controversial because in my mind it's just that idea that we've got if we've got sovereignty over our currency, then how can we also have a debt that we can't pay? It just doesn't make any sense to me. And I feel like a lot of people I talk to who aren't necessarily as interested in economics as I am, um, you know, that sort of that sort of fundamental of it makes sense. Um, it's uh, so yeah, I, it's been pretty good, I think. Um, but uh, I don't know. I might only be interacting with the people who follow me, so maybe everyone else outside of that circle hates me. But um, uh, so far, so good. Um, yeah. I, uh, Bill, you'll give me a, a shout out early if um, inflation goes through the roof and you and I both need to leave the country, or you'll 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 warn me in advance, I assume. Uh, well, I said to someone the other day, if if inflation goes through the roof, then I'm shot. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll disappear into private life very quickly. <laughs> okay, <cool. laughs> yeah, I'll tell, 
I'll uh, I'll just stick to comedy. Um, but, but I've said that quite often during the no- late nineties. I said if, if Japanese uh, ten year bond yields go through the roof, I'm shot. I'll retire and disappear. So I'm still here. So I'm quite confident. Well, I'm happy to tie my wagon to you. It's um it's tricky because I, I you know my 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 love is comedy. I like I like making shows and making people laugh. But I. It's it's I found myself sort of drawn into this topic just because I find it so important because if 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 we can have a shift in the public um in public perception that you know debt isn't the issue that it's made out to be um a government debt then um you know we we might really see some positive change amongst um in politics or some positive policy so um, yeah I I do um it's been hard to sort of try not to think about it and just do comedy stuff because I do want to help get the word out if I can Um, And Luke, I just um, sort of that when you reflect on what it was, I'm just interested in what it was that brought you to your aha moment and that if that influences how you have conversations with people. So, yeah, was there a particular aha moment, a particular MMT idea that really hooked you in? Um, Uh, I I can't remember exactly what. I'd started reading Bill before I met Bill um, and um, that sort of, uh, I think it was a, it was either a, a talk you were doing, Bill, or an interview or, or something um, where it was you and at the time the Reserve Bank of Australia were in the same room. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly what happened um, or if I'm even remembering that correctly, but it was, I, I was doing something for the weekly about um, the government's spending and, uh and debt, and I, I still didn't really understand how government debt worked, um, uh, how the Reserve Bank buys bonds, et cetera, et cetera. So I was starting to, I was starting to sort of drill into that, and then I that sort of gradually led me to a Bill's blog, and then from there I was, I started listening to a few podcasts, and I was all in about MMT because it, it finally clicked for me. I'm like, oh, okay, now I understand um, that um, they, 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 they're not physically uh, physically constrained because they. They have sovereignty over their currency, which made sense to me. Um, whereas when I was at uni, I never, I could never quite get my head around it. I could quote what the lecturer told me, but I didn't quite understand how you could be, you could have an issue, you have, a, you could have difficulty paying for a debt when you were able to create money. It just didn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I, I, I sort of, I reflect on it quite a bit because I, there was really a quite a definite aha moment for me when my. Um, when my cousin Louisa explained how um, tax dollars that were paid in cash or dollars tax that was paid in cash to post offices in the U S was um, burnt or <laughs> shredded. And, you know, and then I, that just was, you know, it just blew my mind. And I thought, you know, obviously then the taxes aren't needed to go back to the government to spend and, um, it was just that sort of really evocative image of shredded dollars, and mm. that really, yeah, turned me around. And oh, uh, and uh, and Bill talking about—you probably heard this one too, Jane. Um, Bill, you were talking about the price of wool, and the government would just buy wool and not do anything with it. Would just sit in a containers. Is that well? That's that's where I really started this MMT journey, and. Uh... For those who don't know, briefly, 1978, Melbourne, Melbourne University, freezing cold day in winter. I was in my fourth year of uh, studies at the honours year. And um, I remember one of the subjects I had to do as part of the fourth year was agricultural economics. And this particular day we were talking about the wool price stabilisation scheme. And if you think back, 1978 was when unemployment had already broken out of full employment, was rising, it was 7% or 6% or something like that. And on the way up, uh, Phil Lynch and Malcolm Fraser's Razor Gang was hacking into uh, government spending and youth unemployment. So there was a real big problem emerging. We had really were at the beginning of the breaking of the full employment consensus that we had had since the Second World War. And uh, this wool price stabilisation scheme involved the, it was basically a scheme for uh, farmers, because the agricultural lobby, of course, in Australia, you know, still is, and a powerful lobby. And they had convinced the government that they wanted stable incomes over, spread out over a long period rather than the boom and bust cycles from the terms of trade. 
And so the government agreed that they would stabilise farm incomes in the wool sector by buying up surplus wool and storing it in big warehouses if there was too much wool produced, which would suppress the price and therefore incomes. And if there wasn't enough wool produced in any year, which would uh, inflate the price, the government would then sell it out of these wool stores again. So it was like a buffer stock. And those big red brick buildings that are now gentrified apartments in our inner cities, they were wool stores. That's where they stored the wool. And I remember thinking, well, this is effectively a full employment of wool being run by the government to stabilise prices. And the price that the government was willing to pay really set the price of the currency. And uh, so I wasn't so much interested in wool. I wanted to do well in agricultural economics course, obviously, as part of my honours year. But I was very interested in labour markets and I thought, well, if they could do that for wool, they can do it for unemployment. Mm. They can stabilise prices by buying labour off the bottom of the market because unemployed people have zero bid in the same way that there's zero bid if there's uh, uh, in, in wool markets at times. And uh, so that that's sort of what I how I came into this and that began my MMT journey, really, 1978. It would be, it would be a way of stabilising wages at a certain level or at a, at a, at a minimum? Um, uh, well, wages and prices are tend to be intrinsically linked yeah. through cost pressures and markups. But, uh, yeah, clearly it was a price stabilisation scheme because if the uh, if there were was an inflation, because remember at that time, I mean, my whole motivation was uh, uh, to be able to reduce unemployment without causing in, worsening the inflation because at that time inflation had spiked up around 18% and was still very high in double digits. And uh, the whole narrative at the time was that we have to uh, kill the economy to get rid of inflation. But killing the economy was going to produce un more and more unemployment. And my big motivation as a young academic and what I followed as I became a, a PhD student was to try to work out a way where you could stabilise the inflation without causing increasing unemployment and that's where where I got the idea of a job guarantee from and uh, that if the government uh, uh, has to break the inflation wage spiral by suppressing demand which is one way to do it that would cause unemployment but as if if, if as they were causing unemployment they bought the labor up at a fixed price then that that couldn't be inflationary but it would provide some relief to the unemployment. That was the idea. It wasn't really a job creation plan. It was a stabilisation plan not to cause unemployment. Now, because we haven't had that inflation in recent years, a lot of MMT people coming into our work think that the job guarantee is just about employment creation. Well, that's sort of a derivative of the idea. Um, and I guess that sort of leads on to uh, what's happening with the Labor Party. They've made an announcement just recently about um, a white paper on full employment, and I wondered, Bill, uh, have you had a chance to look at what that, the details of that and um, is it consistent with MMT or is it just... Um, what are we talking about, Jane? I missed um, Have you... The, the Labor Party have um, announced a full... a white paper for full employment just in the last few days, about, yeah, six days ago. wondered if you had a chance. I haven't fully read it yet and uh, what I've read is uh, uh, a lot of motherhood statements. There's certainly no commitment to government job creation of the type that's necessary to... Uh, take us back to the days where we had true full employment. And ultimately, we know that the Labor Party is wedded to uh, new Keynes in macroeconomics, which means that it believes it's got a fiscal constraint. And it means, and, and that will always cruel or militate against true full employment policies. Mm. And the Labor Party, what I read in it, the Labor Party still can't get out of the activation type mentality, the supply side mentality in terms of 
the problem is training. We've got to train more people. Well, no, we don't. We have to give more people jobs and the training will come. Because in the 1960s, there was always more vacancies than there were unemployed. And that created an incredibly dynamically efficient environment because employers had to offer training as well as jobs and get the round pegs into the square holes. And that was, uh, th that's been lost now. And the Labor Party haven't got, got away from that training myth. And that goes for the unions as well, who are sort of, you know, more preoccupied with the collective bargaining without really understanding that, you know, they're, they're bargaining against um, unemployed workers, the, you know, the bargaining power is anchored at with the unemployed workers who have. And so, I, yeah, I think it's, um, it seems, it's very frustrating and I think cracking through that, uh, yeah, do you foresee or see in the future that maybe the Labor Party will shift or are there any signs that they may shift? No, I don't think so. What about you, Luke? Or... Um, well, I hope one day um, all political parties <laughs> um, embrace um, their uh, fiscal powers. Um, I, I, what I get more curious about, I guess, is, um, you know, if hypothetically Liberal and Labor were more... Um, like they both said, yep, MMT's the like both their treasurers said MMT's the go. Um, so let's let's start spending, knowing that we're not fiscally constrained, other than by you know inflation and that sort of thing. How would you um, like? Does the structure of politics have to change? Does the Reserve Bank's role have to change? Because you you know if politicians can say we're going to give everyone who votes for us fifty grand a day, um, versus you know how do you how do you like politicians have they're not necessarily known for their good decisions how do you how do you sort of balance what's best for the economy versus what's best for the election in an mmt world well it is an mmt world remember that's true yeah i guess um i guess at the moment it feels like the reserve bank and this is my theory it's certainly not proven but i feel like the reserve bank is on board with mmt and knows that's how it works but sort of structures things as it does to, as a way of controlling politicians spending um i don't know what you think about that bill or you know if it's a more direct funding approach um how do we you know how do we monitor that does the reserve well, bank have power to say this is actually going to cause inflation if you spend any more than this so we'll have to stop you there like how does it work i don't see any reluctance um of the federal government to spend when they want to yeah, it's true. Huh? They just, uh, yeah. they, they, when they wanted to do sports routes, there was no talk. When they wanted to do car park routes, there was no talk. When they wanted to build a swimming pool in Christian Porter's electorate to save, <laughs> him, to save him from disaster, electoral defeat in the marginal, there was no, there was no shortage. There's no shortage when they have to fund the military. They, I think this is all political and, uh, they all know what capacity they've got and they use that capacity to, in a political way. And I think what's really happened is that we've lost the concept of public service in our politicians. I mean, if you, think, if you think back to the, uh, if you think back to the Menzies era, now spare the thought, but they, they were much more progressive than the, the Labor Party is now. And they believed in in being, you know, they had a deserving poor concept, but they wanted people. They they wanted an inclusive society. They they funded lots of social welfare and mobility, upward mobility programs. So I think the modern politicians know all of this. They just choose to behave differently. It does feel to me like politicians are trying. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say it's. Um, it does feel to me like politicians are trying to convince us that the interests they serve are going to benefit us, as opposed to just doing things that benefit us. Well, I don't even think that they 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 aim to benefit the population. I think they aim to smokescreen the population to believe they're being benefited. And uh, you know, I mean, when. Uh, when casualisation in the in the labour market started to increase, the, the narratives became really powerful. 
that, oh, this is, this is allowing you to achieve work-life balance and stuff like this. Well, all it was doing was uh, killing off uh, full-time jobs, killing off uh, secure work and forcing low-income workers who had no alternative to work split shifts and morning and evening cleaning jobs at below poverty wages. That's all it was doing. But they, t- they told everyone this is wonderful, flexible labour market that everyone's now got choices. Yeah. And we're getting the government off our back. Well, it was exactly the opposite. And, you know, this the latest cuts to penalty rates, that's being, that was sold as, oh, everybody's going to, we're going to have much more work now and lots more cafes are going to open now because they haven't been able to open because of the penalty rates. Well, it's all a lie. But it's sold to us as a society as if it's a good thing. Um, I just thought we probably, there's a few questions for you, Bill, that um, maybe we can get to before you leave in about 10 minutes. So um, the first one I'll um, read out is from Wayne McMillan and he's asked, Bill, you said once we need to change the socioeconomic cultural narrative and do you think we are making any progress here? Uh, um, We do need to do that. We need to restore the concept of society and we need to restore the concept that each one of us is a member of that society with responsibilities and and aspirations that we we, we have to give to that society but to and expect to take things from it in a fair and equitable way so I grew up as a working class kid most people will probably know that by now I had I was able to have aspirations because I knew the system was supporting upward mobility of kids who grew up in housing commission estates in the post-war period. We could stay at school, we could go to university. If we didn't want to do that, we could get a good apprenticeships, not burger flipping apprenticeships. We could get proper apprenticeships. And if we didn't couldn't get that, we could get a job in a factory and become eventually become a leading hand or something with some. Uh, wage security and uh, up and material security, and uh, and as and we were members of we were a society, and the neoliberal period has, um, you know, and I grew the whole uh, Australian legend, if you want to believe Russell Ward, was about mateship and emerging out of the the uh, war experiences of our troops, etc. That we look after each other. This egalitarianism myth, we all grew up with that. And the neoliberal period has basically t- turned us into individuals where, where it's dog eat dog and, and uh, we've got uh, fractured uh, relations with each other. So some of us are called doll bludgers and some of us are, are not. And we've got cruisers and job snobs and, and we've got identity issues all over the place dividing and conquering us. And all of those things are to destroy the concept of society. And, you know, Maggie Thatcher's famous thing, there's no such thing as society. Well, of course there is. We live in one. We don't live in an economy. We live in a society. And the economy is only there. It's our vehicle to make us transform nature, to, to improve our, our living standards, material living standards. And so this idea that the economy is everything, it's divorced from us, we have to sacrifice uh, uh, that all has to change. Now, whether we're getting there, I don't think so. Mm. Can I just ask Luke a, a quick question? Um, has your understanding of MMT influenced your writing in any way, like on Ra- Rosehaven, for example? Oh, no, I don't really make any MMT jokes on Rosehaven. Um, <laughs> no, no, but, but does it uh, influence it at all? I mean, you know. No, not, not, not my comedy. Um, just how I think about issues... Um, in economics or issues when I listen when I watch politics now. Um, fair, fair enough. Something I really want to pick your brain at at some point, Bill, which we won't have time to do now, is um, I still been trying to get my head around quantitative easing um, because I still don't really understand that. Um, oh well, we, you owe me a dinner, so I do owe you a dinner. So I will, uh, I will, I will, uh, <laughs> we'll see out you some dinner and get you explain quantitative easing to me. It won't take very long. We'll enjoy the meal after it. Okay, great. All right, looking forward to it. And you're allowed to have dinner in Melbourne now? <laughs> well, Luke we and I are. had dinner a couple of weeks ago. It was very nice. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was great. Huh? It was, you could see the city coming alive again. Yeah, yeah. 
I know. I mean, when we booked, when we planned this a month ago, Melbourne was in lockdown and Sydney was, you know, looking from afar and <laughs> that's reversed now, which is, yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get out of it. I just, there's a couple of other questions um, and one for both Luke and Bill and it is from Kit Scott. He says, I'm curious MMT, uh, about MMT, Bill and Luke's views on the need for evolving the GDP model to a wellbeing economy. Oh, Bill, this is probably more you than me. <laughs> well, I've got only, I can cut that short. That's very clear that uh, GDP was, is, is an excellent measure with some defects of uh, production and income generation. Uh, the defects are very obvious and they can be, uh, you know, in terms of uh, imputed household work, it's sort of a, uh, it's gender biased. So, but we misuse, the GDP measure, national account measure was never meant to be an indicator of living standards. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, if we introduce child labour, that would increase GDP, right? Yeah. So it's not oh, all... If we, if we uh, build atomic bombs and go and bomb Japan, we would increase GDP. Right. So it's not all um, swings and roundabouts. No, there's, there's, there's known issues with, with the national accounts measure. But the point I'd make is that it was, it's misused by people as an indicator of living standards, that if GDP is rising, we're better off, whereas it, it doesn't include distributional matters but it also doesn't include lots of other non-material things that really make a society strong. It, it does feel like it's politicians just sort of patting themselves on the back as soon as it goes up a little bit. And they're like, yeah. GDP's gone up, you're welcome. <laughs> it's the same as the unemployment rate. It's, it's a meaningful measure to those who understand it, but it's become a summary measure of the state of the labour market. Now, unemployment can go down and the labour market can deteriorate considerably. So you've got to have a broader understanding of the measures you use. The unemployment rate itself isn't bad measure. It's just that it's a narrow measure. And misusing it to be an indicator of something it's not meant to be is, is the problem. And by that do you mean, Bill, you could have, say, a lower unemployment rate, um, but you could have people working for a dollar picking up nuclear waste, um, but they're still regarded as employed. Is that sort of... The unemployment mean? rate will rise if... Uh, people drop out of the labour force because there's no work. Oh, sorry, the unemployment rate can fall if a whole stack of people drop out of the official labour force because there's no job opportunity, so they can't be bothered looking anymore. Mm -hmm. the, 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 labor, the unemployment rate can fall, as it did during the 1990s, when underemployment rises. So underemployment was never a problem before the 91 recession. After the 91 recession, where a lot of full-time jobs were scrapped and they only came back as part-time jobs, then underemployment became a problem, but unemployment fell steadily through the 90s and everyone said, look at this, it's good. But underutilisation more broadly didn't fall, it rose. Is, is that because people, um, I apologise for my ignorance, but is that because people, to be unemployed, you have to be looking for a job? Willing, not willing to work and looking. Willing to work, right. Willing to work and looking. Right. And so if you if if when if in a recession employment opportunities are not there, people people to you know protect their self-esteem will stop looking. They're sick to death of getting rejected and and uh, not getting interviews, so they stop looking. When the ABS asks them in the survey, have you been looking? They say no. Are you willing to work? Yeah, I'll do it. But there's no work. They get called not in the labour force. They get they're the hidden unemployment. Yeah, right. And Bill, are they captured in the um, the numbers in new people participants in Newstar and DSP and disability? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, how are they actually captured? And how you know is there a can we do we know what proportion of the population have dropped? Well, down? we do know that, but the, uh, it's getting more and more difficult to get that data. And, you know, the other thing is that uh, governments also control what data is produced. Now, this is not a conspiracy hatred on the ABS. The ABS is a great institution and the data they produce is high quality. But think, think about the vacancies, job vacancies. That's now, that was suspended for four or five quarters 
uh, at one point about 10 years ago uh, because it, it, it's, it's, it's politically minefield occasionally. So, and I, I mean, the new, new ABS, uh, the statistician, has it's got a different mentality to the old statistician. And you just if you use the data regularly, you'll see how dramatically better it's come, become in terms of what's available, what they're measuring, how they're using their, their own budget to produce information. It's nearly um, 8 o'clock now. Yes. So, yeah, uh, should we, one more question? Yeah, okay. So, Luke, would you like to ask that or is there, should we go to the Q&A? Oh, no, let, let, let it be yours. I'll, I'll have dinner with Bill anyway. So I've got, I've got, a, I've got a private <laughs> private access. Okay, so um, we have a question from Daniel Harvey and he says, rather than morons, do you think the Labor Party has been badly beaten in the past, not because of bad policy, but because they could not work out how to change the narrative? And they realise this but cannot find a way to get the message through the noise. Look, I'm not a political scientist, so I'm just talking as a civilian. But uh, if, you go back, if you go back to the earlier period of Labor history, um, the type of uh, politicians that were attracted to the Labor Party were quite different to the type of politicians that are attracted now. They went through the trade union movement. They were workers. They didn't get a university degree and then get some sort of uh, trade union job for a short term as a movement, you know, and they weren't lawyers and uh, accountants and things like that. And I think that uh, I think that politics in Australia has become incredibly short-term oriented. And the idea of uh, long-term public services seems to be lost, is my view. And politicians are very risk-averse these days because of the constant polling and 24-7 type scrutiny of them. You know, I, I, had a, I had a dinner just after a federal election a few, several elections ago with the then Shadow Minister for Finance and so you won't know who it is because I won't tell you the election. But uh, he told me the day after they got savaged in the polls, they were out in Western Sydney polling. And I said to him, well, what's, that's not leadership, you know. Why, you know and, and that's the problem. They're poll-driven and so they don't seek to influence the debate they just seek to try to understand what the current sensitivities are rather than push them as leaders but i'm not a political scientist so that's just as a civilian okay so um i think bill if you have to say farewell then um thank just, you and I'm, really appreciate your time sorry for all the hiccups in the beginning that's okay. <laughs> take, um, as always good, good luck take care see you dallas see you Luke. Thank you. <laughs> Until next time. Okay. So um, I, if people would like to um, ask questions live to Luke, um, if you can raise your hands, we can see your hands raised and um, I can switch on your microphone. If, In the meantime, um, if no one asks, so, um, if no one asks, just, Soften my soften the blow for me. Just say the, just say the audience is cut out or something. If no one has any questions, yeah. Um, in the meantime, have you got any um, Luke economics more Luke economics episodes planned segments planned? Uh, well, not until the next season. Um, but the one thing I'd really like to cover is energy policy, just because. Um, and I'm, I'm hesitant to talk about this because I'm really in my research, but basically the um, um, there's an issue with the price of gas in Australia where we're paying um, more for gas here than some of the overseas buyers are. Um, and so I really want to... Um, that just seems like such a crazy thing to me that we pay more for our own gas. Um, uh, and... Um, politicians are aware of it but there hasn't been any policy put in place yet to sort of address that so I really want to do a 
sec- a, a segment on that for the weekly and hopefully like not stop, just keep doing the same segment about power until someone tells me why, like someone in power tells me why um, we pay more for our gas here. Um, so that, um, that's kind of my next thing um, is I want to do energy policy in Australia. And, okay, so we've got a few hands raised. Um, Carmel Gillen, I'm going to turn your mic on so you can ask your question. Usually, there we go. Go ahead. (laughs) Are you there? I think she's gone away. No. (laughs) Okay. All right. Might have just been stretching. And we've got Wayne, Wayne McMillan. So I'll just turn your mic on, Wayne. Luke, I just wanted to know what led you to study um, economics at uni? Um, I, 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 I was very much um, uh, like I really cared about different issues, but I didn't really have any sort of, I felt like when I was arguing with my parents, I didn't have anything to, back up what I was saying. So, I don't know, for example, um, uh, you know, we shouldn't keep refugees in offshore detention. But I, 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 I like to, economics appealed to me because it felt like I could, I could form opinions around numbers. I've always liked spreadsheets. I don't know why, but I really like spreadsheets. Um, and uh, I just thought I, I, economics just appealed to me because I, it, it gave me sort of a little bit of um, maths or numbers or, data around opinions I had and maybe that, you know, I could look at something and then change my opinion because of what the information was telling me. I, I don't know. I just, I just really like economics. I just really like um, that it feels like it's kind of the study of everything almost. Um, it's not necessarily an exact science, but it's, um, I feel like you can apply almost anything to it. Um, uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It just, it, just, it just was like a catch-all subject that really appealed to me. And then did I was you, in comedy. Did, and <laughs> Did you disagree? Did you disagree with uh, some of the things you were being taught back then? Uh, not really, just because I didn't. I was learning that as I got as I as I went. So it wasn't until sort of later in life that I started to question things. Um, uh, you know, it's just little things like, you know, if 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 there's a if there's more demand for something, um, then there is supply of something that the pr- the price of that thing will go up. Whereas in real life, you know. If iPhones are selling out, you don't often see the price of iPhones go up because Apple doesn't want to, um, you know, they're scared of competition or they're scared of the PR if they have up the price of their of their goods. So often companies will keep the price, of the, you know, there might be a shortage of supply, but they'll keep the um, price the same and boost because they don't want the backlash. So it was just little things like that where I'm just like, oh, some of these fundamentals maybe aren't so fundamental. Um, and then that gradually led me to um, MMT and questioning all of it. Uh, we might, um, there's a question, I'll allow Richard Bentley to talk and. What an honour. Huh? Yeah, go. You're ahead. allowed to talk, Richard, go. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. My mute button's come up, so I'm unmuted. How are you, yeah. Luke? Good, mate. Want, how are you? Huh? Yep, yeah, I'm fine. Just wanted to ask a quick question as to whether you'd read The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. Stephanie Kelton. No, I haven't. Um, I haven't read that. Um, he came out to speak at the conference uh, early last year, I think it was, that Bill Mitchell spoke out here in Adelaide. But she's written a, a, a pretty um, easy-to-read book about the American experience, uh, as a, and she was an advisor um, in the uh, American economy, and she saw all the, the, the faults of the Obama period and basically an understanding of, of how politicians can't, can't come to grips with uh, modern monetary theory and, and a f- really good explanation of modern monetary theory. So I'd highly recommend you get hold of a copy of The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. Yeah, I think she was an advisor to Bernie Sanders at one point, wasn't she? Um, I've, I've, I've listened to a podcast with her and I really enjoyed it, so I will, um, I will have to, I'll check it out. Um, I think it's but, well, well worthwhile and it does give an excellent explanation of, of what it's all about and probably also why it's been difficult for most economists uh, in mainstream to uh, to accept it it's a yeah it's a 
it's a strange shift. Um, it, and it's, it's hard for me too to talk to people on the other, like I'm, I'm catching up for um, a coffee with an economist um, I talked to on Q&A um, soon to talk MMT just because, um, you know, she sort of fundamentally believes the other way. Um, so I'm curious to see how that conversation goes because um, uh, I've only so far talked to people who either agree with um, Bill or um, definitely don't, but aren't necessarily in economic circles from... I'm curious to have coffee with an economist. Um, if you read this book before you see her, you'll be well. Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> okay, we'll do. Um, but uh, no, thank you. I'll check it out. I have heard of Stephanie and um, what I've heard from her on podcast and think she's she's great. Yeah. She's actually I'm now a member of a committee with the World Health Organization too, which includes um, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, Kate Rayworth, that's Stephanie and uh, another public health expert called Alona Kickbush and that's the Committee on Economics for Health for All, I think, something like that. So it's um, she's really getting up into the upper echelons of power, which is really promising. So um, Yeah, well, the more MMT is, um, yeah. the better, I think. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. So, um, we, Carmel, uh, Carmen, I don't know if you are able to... Is your microphone working? Because um, um, can you yeah. hear me? Oh, yeah. oh great! Hello. <laughs> Hi, Luke. Um, look, I, this could be a really <laughs> stupid question. I don't have an economic mind at all, but I'm oh, just no, so. I'm, I'm, um, I've asked plenty of dumb questions. So go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, here's this. Here, here's my really cr strange question. I've just been wondering because. Um, I'm, I think this subject is so important and I find it really hard trying to, you know, engage just friends and family. Um, but I'm just wondering, is, is it is it even possible to frame this economic narrative as transitioning to MMT? Like the same way we talk about, well, should be talking about transitioning to renewables um, or is it not... Is it not really kind of appropriate? You either do it or you don't. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Would using the word transitioning um, kind of make – because it's such a big change that we're asking people to, you know, to jump into that, uh, you know, I find with the renewables thing, when you talk renewables and they hear the word transitioning – they're more willing to talk about it. So uh, I don't know. I don't. Do, do you understand what I'm? Yeah, I I I, I, I get it. And that um, you know, how do you uh, how do you bring people across? Is there a sort of a big yeah. area we need to be in? Um, I, I thought of one one thing I thought about is just um, and Jane Dillis, let me know what you think. Is whether um, modern monetary theory is a bad name? Whether theory needs to leave? Yeah. Because it does. When I know when Bill talks about it, it's he's saying I'm, what I'm describing is what's actually happening now. It's just that people aren't acknowledging it. Um, so it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, I don't know if this helps, but um, something I do when I'm talking to my family about it or people who aren't necessarily interested in economics, I think about um, if you had an island um, and you wanted people on your island to spend your dollars. So if I had Luke Island, I had Luke Bucks. Um, uh, in order for people to pay taxes in Luke Bucks, I'd have to pay them money first. I'd have to spend my Luke dollars first. Um, so the government spending comes before the taxes. Um, so I don't know if that helps um, people. Um, um, that, yeah, that brings to mind for me the hut tax, which was um, in sort of in colonial Africa uh, when England came in and tried to um, get the local inhabitants to work for them. They wouldn't because they didn't, you know, they had their own work. They were, you know, meaningfully occupied and... Um, the, so the, the English decided to impose a hut tax and if they didn't pay their tax, they would come along and burn their hut down and oh, wow. so it forced them, it made them unemployed basically in, you know, in a new economy that was imposed by the English. And so it's interesting. I think it's like it, the sequence of the tax has to be imposed and it's kind of a coercion to ex to drive the the money, the acceptance of that that currency, and um, Carl, um, can I just come in there as well? I know Bill would mm. object to the whole idea that we can we actually transition to MMT because it's a description of the way the monetary system works. So we might That's transition true. to yeah. using that as a view of how the economy works, 
because most of the neoclassical economists don't use that view, don't use that lens. So we need to transition to a view of how the economy works that's the, that's the realistic one, which MMT uh, already, you know, describes. Yeah, I think because I have heard that um, put before that it's like we're already we're doing MMT or MMT exists. Um, but you're, you're right. I, I guess that's more what I meant about, yeah, transitioning to getting people to start to to, to see in another way. I, I just feel it's yeah. such a big ask. It's such a big ask for people. But when they get it, I mean, and even Luke who said it took him years, he studied economics and it took him years to kind of, you know, till the, the penny dropped or whatever. So I think it's a big ask just for your average, you know, person who's not the least bit interested in economics. Um, I, and yet it's... I think it'll... I think it'll change. Oh, sorry, Cameron. I think it'll change as right. um, if you uh, like. If you look at Japan's situation, that does have a debt to GDP ratio of two hundred and fifty percent. Whereas in Australia, I think what are we now around forty percent? I think about forty. About forty. Yeah. Um, and we've often had governments that have tried to you know get us back in a surplus and sort of balance the budget, as they say. I think as we you know if you look at Labor's uh, Liberal, sorry, um, the intergenerational report that said we're going to be in deficit and you know for another till two thousand and sixty mm. or something like that. I think as we see continued deficits but low inflation, eventually the narrative will start to change just because those arguments that we used to be able to throw around just won't be relevant because we'll, the proof will be mm. in the economy. So I think that will help Good. us eventually <laughs> transition over to a better understanding of how the financial system works to, amongst more because eventually the politicians will stop yelling at each other, you're, you're raising the debt. And as soon as they stop doing mm. that, I think that'll change the discussion fairly more fundamentally. Good. Hope so. Needs to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Thank you, Carmen. Carmel, thanks. That's okay. Oh, sorry, is it Carmel? Uh, Carmel. Carmel, with an L, with an L. Carmel, sorry, yeah. Carmel. Thanks for your question. <laughs> no worries. Um, and Damien Palmer would like to ask a question, so I'll let him ask that. And your microphone is on now. It should be. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, Damien, go for yep. it. Can you hear me all right? Yep, we can hear you, yep. Long build-up. Uh, Damien, Damien, pausing for dramatic you. effect. Can you hear or us? Are you, uh, can you hear me now? You? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we can, can hear now. you. Yep. Yep. You can hear me? Yep. Yes. Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. We might, um, it seems there's a problem there. <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah. Jane. laughs> uh, Next question is from Jengus. So oh, this is question was, can you hear me? In which case we answered it, which was yes. <laughs> so I'm going to call it a success. Sir. Uh, we did. So, yeah, very good. Jengus, um, we'll, um, I'll turn your microphone on now. Hello, how are you? Hi. Good, mate, how are you? Good. Uh, but I had a question about um, changing the idea of work. So if you had a future where people had an understanding that what we call money is just a social and legal construct and there's no intrinsic financial constraint, how would you like to see that sort of understanding um, impact on, on the arts and changing the idea that the arts is a very valuable and productive sector of um, society. Um, yeah, I think, uh, and I, I hope I'm answering your question and saying this, but I, I feel like the arts is good because arts is what, um, arts is kind of a, in a way, an infinite employer. Um, you, uh, you know, um, by creating a, a, a movie, a, a gallery, uh, like the, the whereas, um, you know, uh, people need a finite amount of, say, televisions, um, uh, you know, and this, I'm, I'm really simplifying here, but the arts can sort of keep, it can just keep generating content. Um, so it's, um, it is exciting to me that, uh, you know, as um, politicians start embracing MMT a bit more than we might see the arts industry flourish a bit more with funding just because they can, it is a place for, um, you know, that can really generate a lot of employment without necessarily having to um, 
rely on a resource that's scarce. Does that make does that make sense, Jane Dallas? Am I explaining myself well there? Um, yes. Dallas so might yeah. want to comment there. Yeah. Look, um, you know, I, I've been involved in the arts for a long time. Uh, that that was my whole career, and there are so many uh, uh, theatre groups, for example, who operate as collectives, and everybody's supposed to get a share of the profits. Well, they never make any, and nobody ever gets any money. So those people work for nothing. Now, if all of those people could be classified as uh, valid people to be working under a job guarantee, we'd get a flourishing of that kind of work. Uh, and, you know, th there's no reason why that can't, can't happen, why that shouldn't be funded. Uh, and a job guarantee, if it covered people like that in the arts, would be just fantastic. And, Jengis, what's your um, views? You would have views on that? Yeah. Yeah, I think the art is so important to what makes us human and helps us form an identity. And I really see um, that, whether through a job guarantee and well, other arts programs, as really helping people choose, you know, what, what vocation it is they want to get into um, because I, I feel it's such an important area in um, determining a self um, and it allows people to focus and with what what it is they want to do um, and like Luke and Dallas said um, I'd like to see that you know whole communities flourish um, and people like um, theatre companies and or theatre groups and community festivals and you know local zines and those sorts of things um, be established. Um, I, I agree I think um yeah, it's uh, and also you know it's such an intrinsic part of everything with the human beings. The arts is it's really hard to separate arts out from uh, anything. Like even if you know looking behind us at my bed sheet and like every decoration around our house is like it's all linked to the arts. Um, uh, the the music that plays um, before a politician speaks, like it's it's just the graphic design of the um, the liberal logo. Like this, arts is just everywhere in our lives. Everything we single thing we do for fun, um, I guess the sports as well, but involves the arts in some way. I just, it feels like it's just such an important part of being human. Um, it's crazy to me that it can go underfunded sometimes. So. Yeah, I feel there's a real uh, the way that we talk about the economy. The arts is seen as a as a cost um, and the, there's always cuts to the arts, to that sector um, because it's deemed as unnecessary and that's the, the rhetoric and I think it's about trying to, to say, well, no, um, you know, the arts isn't the cost. There's a tremendous benefit there. It's um, also um, back in talking back, I used to be a, a, a data analyst um, and one of the things that um, was always tricky would say, um, an advertising campaign that we're trying to evaluate the impact of. Um, I always think about that in terms of the arts. Like if you if you host a comedy show and you have a hundred people in a room, or a thousand people in a room, um, and those thousand people they pay for parking, they go um, um, to a restaurant that night, they might go for a drink as well. So there's all this economic economic activity that that that, that one show has generated. Um, but it's really hard to attribute it back to the show. It's really hard to link that data. Um, because, you know, the restaurant's a separate expense to the show and it's so even though we know logically that the arts must create a, a flow-on effect to the rest of the economy, it's not always easy for, um, you know, a theatre company trying to get money from the government to say, listen, we really are doing a good thing here. Um, you know, they've only got their own books to, to show. So it's a shame when politicians don't see that value. You, Luke, you did, a, you did a pretty good summary on uh, Charlie Pickering's oh, thanks. <laughs> about that at one stage. Have you... Um, $2.17 billion a year or something and 600,000 jobs, I think, is, was the, were the figures. Yeah, it was it was huge. It was, and it's a weird, some people sort of said that figure was too high, but I, um, because it, part of it was linked to, um, when you look at the creative arts, you're also looking at things like, um, you know, designers and things like that. But I, I actually think the number's probably higher just because there's so much of the arts, um there's so much money that the arts, uh, or there's so much demand that the, or spending that the arts generates that just doesn't get attributed directly to the arts that I think it's um, it's a lot higher. I mean, you can't sell a can of Fanta without arts, 
you know, the music for the commercial, the the ad, the painting on the can, like it's it's just everything's connected to the arts. Um, you know, sorry, I'm sounding very preachy now, but um, yeah, the Australian <laughs> Council did quite a lot of work on that back in the '80s about the the, the multiplier effect of money spent in the arts. Uh, yeah, not sure if they've done any of that recently. I haven't really kept up, but yeah. Yeah. All right. And um, and I think there's a couple of questions here, Luke, and we might need to wind up after these two questions, I think. Are you ready? Are you ready to leave? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> am I ready to leave? <laughs> I don't want to take it too long, but, yeah, there's two um, There's two more questions and I, I think they'll good, be good ones to wind up on. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he, um, Murray Hopkins says, thanks for your great run out of money video. Would you consider doing a video on the job guarantee and um, enabling people to understand what is actually being proposed by MMT would be a great thing also to shift the narrative from the UBI? So are you, do you have any plans? Was that something on the cards? Um, maybe. Uh, the Sorry, you'll have to, apologies for my ignorance, what's the UBI? Uh, universal basic income and oh, universal basic income, right? Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I'm with MMT. I'm just so all I want is for people to understand that um, having sovereignty over our currency gives us um, um, what the consequences of that are. And I, for me, the job guarantee is that that's what it's called isn't it, the job guarantee the yeah yeah it feels more like a policy within mmt as opposed to necessarily intrinsically linked to the idea that because you could do very you know corporate focused policies with a still with that mmt mindset so i, I haven't necessarily decided to dig down into that just because i'm i guess i'm more concerned with trying to change people's fundamental view of it as opposed to the the policies that sort of come out of it, but I don't know. Maybe the answer is maybe. I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, it I does interest. It does interest me. Um, yeah, I think the 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 idea that we have at the moment a buffer stock of unemployed to um, maintain price stability, and so we have all of that wasted potential and suffering to control inflation, whereas we could have a buffer stock of employed. And then, you know, the benefits to society and to the individuals themselves, you know, are, are huge. And that is uh, an inherent part of MMT in terms of the automatic stabiliser and controlling inflation. So I think, yeah, I think it would, it, I think that's a key um, part of understanding MMT and putting that across. And it's often... There's a lot of hostility to it and a lot of mischaracterization too. I think sort of characterizing it as a work for the doll scheme. And so yeah, I think a sort of a satirical um, treatment of it or a sort of humorous treatment of it or yeah, would be quite a useful thing. Um yeah, maybe I'm I, I, I it sounds like I should because I I'm I'm not that across it. Um I uh so I, it's probably something I should look into just because it is, I think unemployment in Australia is, um, I, I don't like the way we view or sort of stigmatise unemployment in Australia at the moment. So I, I, was wanting, I was wanting to do a piece on unemployment and, and uh, the way we sort of talk about it in the media. So, yeah, maybe I should um, investigate that. So, no, thank you, thank you for the suggestion. I will, um, I will, I will try and make it funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. So... Um... We might leave it there. That's an hour and a half nearly. And um, we oh, did we have two questions or one? I feel like we've... Well, there was another question from Avis Williamson who um, it may be re it's related to the previous question and would satire help develop people's understanding um, of MMT and how do you... I, th I think humour helps everything, right, <laughs> as far as explaining something, just because it's if you're laughing, it's... Uh, I feel like if people are laughing, they're a bit more open to hearing what you have to say because laughing's a... A nice thing to be doing or barking um so it's uh yeah i think humor <laughs> humor helps i mean i certainly rely on it a lot anyway yeah yeah i think it def definitely helps and i think 
Um, I mean, I'm always cheering if I see you coming up on the TV talking about MMT. It makes a big difference in, you know, drawing people in and engaging them. So, yeah, I think you need to do more. Yeah. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. I will, uh, I will <laughs> keep doing it as long as they let me. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think we'll wind it up. Dallas, do you want to say anything? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Dallas, you, you muted. You muted. <laughs> I'll, un I'll unmute myself. Luke, um, what we didn't get to much tonight was you'd indicated at one stage that you would actually quite like to ask Bill a few questions of some of the things, the sorts of questions that people ask you that you feel you don't quite know enough about and you'd actually like to pose them to Bill. Now, you could do that over that dinner, but you could also do it on another one of these Zooms, perhaps. That's true, yes. I'm, I'm always up for talking to Bill. Um, so, yeah, the job guarantee be one because I, I don't really have my head across it and uh, quantitative easing is another one. I don't really have my head across that either. Um, so I, um, those two things are things that I'd love to hear Bill talk about. Um, so we might we might try and arrange that um, for some future Zoom perhaps. All right. It's, it's very rude of you to ask me to be on another Zoom while I'm already on a Zoom because then I can't say, no, nah, because <laughs> I look like a jerk. <laughs> You're supposed to ask for But, yes, I would be happy to do that. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, we'll leave it at that. And thank you, everyone. Um, we don't have any more webinars planned. I, we, I did have a program of webinars. Well, we do now. Dallas just, Dallas just impressed <laughs> me in a while. So we've <laughs> just Luke into another one. Yes. Um, so we'll see you at the next one. We'll do it after this. We'll do it straight after this one. <laughs> Um, but no, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to come on again and talk to Bill um, and uh, and you guys. Just tell whatever I can do to help spread the word, I suppose. It sounds like a religion. And I, I really, I, I don't want MMT to sound culty when I talk about it, which is my fear, because I, I, it does feel like just an economic fundamental to me. But um, sometimes the way I talk about it, I'm like, you need to understand. Yeah, it is, yeah I do have that yeah zeal as well, which is all right. Um, well, we, um, we better say telling. goodbye. Pardon? It's the throwing things at the telly syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say farewell and I'll um, press the um, end meeting button. And thanks to all the people that attended. And also thanks for people who donated. So that was fantastic. We raised quite a bit of money to cover some of the costs of Zoom. Excellent. And Excellent. I charge $100,000 a webinar, so that's, <laughs> yeah. you know, I hope, you, I hope you've gotten close to that otherwise. <laughs> yeah, we did, yeah. Not oh, great, just, great. Yeah. Send it through. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thanks for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I, um, I'm happy to be a part of what we call it, a community. I don't know, but I, I thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Thank you. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.